In the previous episode, we presented the case of an elderly individual who presented with shortness of breath with exertion. We said how the majority of times shortness of breath is due to diseases of the heart and lung, but in this patient, they had significant anemia, meaning they had very low hemoglobin levels. We often talk about anemia in terms of hemoglobin rather than red blood cell count because what we care about is the oxygen carrying capacity of the red blood cell, which is determined by the hemoglobin concentration. And the most common cause of anemia is due to iron deficiency. So what test would you have sent in this patient? The answer would be a ferritin level. Why? Well, we saw that the hemoglobin was low. That's not unique to iron deficiency. The MCV is low. That too is not unique because issues like thalassemia or lead poisoning can lead to a low MCV anemia. And we're going to talk about thalassemia and you're going to understand it. Uh, but this patient also had a reticulocyte count that was normal. But was it normal? If someone's hemoglobin is 6.6, that's half of what their normal hemoglobin should be, what would you expect the bone marrow to do? It should make a lot of reticulocyte count. The fact that it's normal, it's abnormally normal. You don't need to calculate the retic index. I can tell you the marrow is not doing its job. And so if you put all that together, not enough reticulocytes, a low MCV, a slow process, you're really making a case for iron deficiency. And so we sent a ferritin level, and that came back at seven, which is very, very low, clinching the diagnosis of iron deficiency. You will understand iron deficiency really well at the end of this episode, but I have something very important to share with you. Iron deficiency is not the end of the diagnostic journey. It's just the beginning. It is an injustice to patients to end with iron deficiency. Here's some iron tablets. We'll see you later. You're just putting a Band-Aid on the wound. You're not getting to the root cause of the wound. The next question is, why iron deficiency? This is probably going to be one of the most important things we teach on this channel, is never stop asking why. Our patient had shortness of breath. Why? Anemia. Why do they have anemia? Iron deficiency. Why do they have iron deficiency? We're going to get to that shortly. So let's first start at um, how do you diagnose iron deficiency? Because I think we'll start there, then we'll talk about iron distribution, iron homeostasis, and then the causes of iron deficiency. And you need to understand all this to really do justice for your patients. I love this figure created by one of my favorite people, Zavin. And what Zavin said is, okay, I'm working up anemia and I want to solve greater than 95% of iron states. If the ferritin is low, then you have iron deficiency done. And ferritin is the primary way that we store iron because iron, if not stored in ferritin, is toxic to our cells. So we store it as ferritin and then ferritin can release iron when we need iron. But what does low mean? Anything less than 50 is low. And I would even say anything less than 100 should make you think about iron deficiency. Some people say less than 15. The problem with less than 15 is that while specific and you've definitely confirmed iron deficiency like our patient, you're going to miss a lot of people with iron deficiency that have a ferritin of, let's say, 35, 40, or even 70. But let's say the ferritin is high because the ferritin is something called an acute phase reactant, meaning when you're inflamed, the ferritin goes up. And a way to think about this is that the last thing you want to do is if you're inflamed from bacteria is to give iron to bacteria. Whether this is true or not, I'm not sure, but it makes sense to think of it like this. The ferritin goes up to store the iron to hide it from the bacteria. So then how can you diagnose it? It's through the percent sat. And in fact, in our patient, I end up sending the iron and the percent sat simultaneously because the last thing I want to do is get a ferritin of 60 and be like, oh, is, are they really iron deficient? So it is cost effective. The percent sat is the iron divided by the transferrin iron binding capacity. You see, transferrin is the protein that carries iron in the blood. 
And when someone's ferritin is really high or their iron stores are nice and replenished, the body is smart. The transferrin is low. But when someone's iron is low, the ferritin is low because their iron stores are low, but the body cells want iron. So you increase transferrin production. So if you take the low iron and you have the higher transferrin, you're going to have a low percentage. And so less than 15 is iron deficiency. You have to use a higher cutoff for patients with chronic kidney disease, which you'll understand momentarily, actually, as we discuss iron further. So now let's discuss iron distribution, because if you want to know how can someone become deficient, it's good to know where are, where is iron stored? Where do you think the majority of iron is stored? It's in hemoglobin. Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is what we care about in red blood cells. It's the oxygen-carrying protein. It consists of heme and globin. What is heme? Heme is when iron goes into porphyrin. And I just think it's so fascinating how this all works out. The body, the bone marrow, has stem cells. These stem cells produce red blood cells, and those red blood cells are more than capable of creating the porphyrin, which is the ring, and the globin normally. But what it requires or what it depends on is through external sources of iron ingestion. So the iron goes into porphyrin to make the heme, then globin, the protein goes around it, and now you've made a beautiful molecule or a beautiful structure that can bind oxygen and deliver it to the tissues. We actually spent $3.50 to create an animation. Um, my partner said, man, it looks like you made this for children, but hey, I learned through basic stuff and I hope you appreciate this too. But in this animation, check it out. What you see is, the porphyrin binding to the iron, making the heme, surrounded by the globin, which then binds the oxygen that ultimately delivers it to tissue. And then where else is iron stored? We already said that ferritin is a primary way that our cells store iron. Some of it is in muscle cells, myoglobin, but only a very small percentage is actually in the blood, less than 0.1%. And that's transferrin. Transferrin carries iron to the marrow, to the cells, um, and delivers it. So now that you understand where the iron is distributed, it's good to understand iron, how do we actually get iron into the system? This figure is really important to understand. So we ingest iron either in meat, which is the heme iron, or vegetables. And once it's ingested, in this you know, in the proximal intestines is where you absorb iron in the duodenum and the jejunum. You need these iron channels to absorb iron, where it then enters the blood and carried as transferrin or it gets stored as ferritin. And then once it gets carried as transferrin to the bone marrow, we just said the bone marrow is capable of making um, the globin and the porphyrin, but it needs the iron to bind into the porphyrin to make the heme. And that's how you get red blood cells. And these red blood cells often are large reticulocytes, especially if you're having an acute episode of anemia, and then they mature into red blood cells. So in our patient, we know they're iron deficient. So since they're iron deficient, they just can't make reticulocytes. It wouldn't make sense to try to make red blood cells if you don't have iron, because if you don't have iron, you can't make heme. You can't insert it into porphyrin. And this is one of the ways you can tell iron deficiency from thalassemia. Both of them cause microcytosis, but in thalassemia, the issue is with globin production, not with iron. So as long as you have iron, you're going to still make reticulocytes and you're going to still make red blood cells. So they're going to be small. So the red blood cells are going to be normal or high in thalassemia, but in iron deficiency, it's going to be low. And this is referred to as the Menser index, where you take the size of the red blood cell, the MCV, and you divide it by the red blood cell count. In thalassemia, the MCV is small, but the red blood cell count is normal or high, giving you a low ratio of less than 13. In iron deficiency, 
The MCV is low, but also is the red blood cell, giving you a ratio of greater than 13. You need to know this because so many people are mislabeled as iron deficient, while in fact they actually have thalassemia. And if you're giving iron to someone with thalassemia, you're not solving the problem. You're just iron overloading them. So now that you, so now that you understand the distribution of iron, you understand how we actually get iron into the system. If I ask you the question of what's the most common cause of iron deficiency, it now all makes sense. If most of the iron is in hemoglobin, if we lose hemoglobin, not in an obvious way, but a slow oozing pattern, you're gonna lose more than 50% of your iron stores. In our patient, the ferritin was seven, the iron was undetectable. So they had lost a lot of hemoglobin, or at least that's where we wanted to start. And the most common cause of hemoglobin loss is either through the GI tract, especially in men and postmenopausal women, but in premenopausal women, it's through menstruation. Because if you're losing hemoglobin with menstruation, you're losing iron and you need, um, you may develop iron deficiency and need supplementation. There are less common causes of iron deficiency that we won't discuss, but you can look at the figure here. I think it's important to understand this category because if when we looked at that figure, when we looked at the figure of iron homeostasis, we saw that hemoglobin was where the majority of iron is, but we have to also think about how iron got there. And so if there's issues in the stomach, like you don't have enough acid because you're on a proton pump inhibitor, that can lead to impaired freeing up of iron to be absorbed in the channels and the small intestines. Or if you have celiac disease where the intestines are just not functioning properly and it's malabsorptive, you might not have enough iron. In fact, it's a common way that patients present with celiac disease is with iron deficiency anemia. In cases where there's inflammation like CKD and heart failure, you get this really important um, protein, hepcidin, that's synthesized in the liver. And hepcidin plays a crucial part in iron homeostasis. It basically decreases the channels in the intestines to absorb iron. So if someone has a really high ferritin and iron level, the body is going to release hepcidin. Hepcidin is going to decrease absorption from the small intestines. But there are other states where the body is inflamed, not because you have a high iron, we're just inflamed, and therefore you get hepcidin release and you have impaired iron absorption in the small intestine. This is actually why now we prescribe iron every other day or once a day as opposed to three times a day. Because when you give it three times a day, the body thinks, wow, this is way too much iron, even though the iron stores are low and it releases hepcidin and impairs absorption. So it's counterproductive by giving too much oral iron. We kept asking why. Why short of breath? Anemia. Why anemia? Iron deficiency. Why iron deficiency? Well, we went at the most common cause of iron deficiency, and that's the intestinal tract. We did an upper endoscopy, it was normal. Then we did a colonoscopy, and that showed multiple arteriovenous malformations, AVMs. But in order to understand AVMs, you have to understand what a normal vessel looks like. And here we have the arterial, then we have the capillary bed, and then we have the venule. This is normal, this is beautiful. A lot of good stuff is released from the capillary to the cells to feed them to survive. But what happens if you have no capillary bed and you have a direct connection between the arterial and the venule? You have a fragile vessel, an AVM, that's vulnerable to bleeding, especially if someone's on anticoagulation, but they can spontaneously bleed. These vessels are created because someone is not having enough blood perfusion to the intestines. And the number one cause for that is just aging. As we age, everything becomes dysfunctional from our brains to our bone marrow to our ability to perfuse the intestines. And the body is smart. It says, wait a minute, I'm not getting enough blood. I'm gonna make blood vessels, AKA angiogenesis. But when it does that, it makes these dysfunctional vessels. They're not useful. And these are vulnerable to bleeding. So when we did this scope in our patient, we saw four or five of these in the distal colon and we cauterized and clipped them. And I say we as if I had any involvement in the procedure, I did not. But here it just shows how these can cause bright red blood or if they slowly ooze and um, the bacteria degrades the hemoglobin, you can get really black tarry stool known as melana. So to summarize, we learned an approach to anemia that's based on the time course. We learned an approach to subacute to progressive anemia, the most common cause that either has to do with the marrow 
or the ingredients to produce red blood cells. We talked about iron deficiency and how with iron deficiency over time, you don't make enough reticulocytes. So a normal reticulocyte count is abnormally normal. And we said iron deficiency is just the start of the diagnostic journey. And most often it's either due to hemoglobin loss where most of the iron is through the GI tract or through um, menstruation or, or the gynecologic tract but we talked about other causes of iron loss that could involve in the stomach, like not having enough acid or the small intestines, malabsorption like celiac disease. In our patient, we learned they had AVMs, they were older, um, and they had these fragile vessels that were vulnerable to bleeding. Luckily, we were able to cure their issue. And now, um, the thing we didn't talk about which I wish we had enough time to, is like, how do we actually replenish iron stores? In this patient, we went IV, and um, once we started giving the iron, we started seeing good hemoglobin production. That's a wrap, folks. <laughs>